Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. We are in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, last week we finished up, or didn't finish, but we got into talking about the triumphal procession. I want to kind of talk about that a little bit because it's, it's kind of neat. It kind of gives a perspective of the victory that we have in Christ. And then get into uh, the reasons why Paul was addressing the triumph of Jesus Christ. The issue is basically uh, the sufficiency of Christ. We have the victory. I mean, these are basic Protestant doctrines. But it's very easy for us to slip back into something else. Is we have the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. He has done the work. He's rescued us. Uh, we can only stay in Christ and grow in Christ and rejoice in Christ. There's nothing that we need to do to attain Christ or, or stay in Christ. He is the sufficiency. We see that in the Old Testament. We've been going through on Monday nights. We're going through eschatology. On Tuesday nights, we're going through Hosea. And the theme just keeps coming up that mankind is without hope. Man cannot help himself. No matter what he does, he's going to always end up falling short. You may have some great individuals, but there's always going to be some shortcoming or a series of shortcomings that's going to prove that they're a disaster to themselves. You can see that all the way through the Old Testament, see it all the way through the New Testament, except for Christ. Mankind can't be disciplined enough. We see that in Hosea where God is going to send them into captivity or he's going to send plagues or he's going to send something to cause them to repent and come back to him, but they can't. They, they can be sorry, they can wish it was better, but they do not have the ability to become holy, to become what God expects them to be, or to become what God created man to be. Man needs Jesus Christ to become what God intended man to be, to fulfill his purpose. He needs to be brought into Christ. And so since we have the sufficiency of Christ, the, the fallacy, the problem is going to be ideologies coming alongside and replacing Jesus Christ. Maybe it's some kind of religious activity. If it's some kind of philosophy, some kind of an intellectual argument, something that's going to replace Christ and put the emphasis back on mankind. I'll show you right here in chapter 2, uh, if I get through this triumphal procession, there's four things that are presented that the, the Colossians are dealing with the heresy that is coming to the church. Paul has presented Jesus Christ. In, well, of course, Paul hasn't ever been to Colossae, but the gospel is brought to Colossae. They've been presented with the truth, and now things have come in and replaced. It's human tendency, and we need to watch ourselves because we will do the same thing. So here we go, chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to begin in verse 8, read down to, say, verse 18, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll pick up where we left off last week. Chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority in him. You were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by hands, by men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code that with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he nailed it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That's where we'll pick up. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up. He's lost connection with the head. So, the verse we're picking up with is right here, that written code. There is this written document that was against us, that was opposed to us. We gave you several options of what that could refer to. It was something that came against mankind. It, it may have been just general revelation. It may have just been the general ideal of sin. 
It may have been the law of Moses. It may have been something that every man acknowledges that I am not perfect. I am a sinner. I am not worthy of God. I've been cut off from the presence of God. And just by your very essence, the very your, your consciousness, you realize this is against you. Something was against mankind. It was taken and put on the cross. It says nailed to the cross. When it was nailed to the cross, that could have been a proclamation that this has been paid. It is no longer a debt, and that's what they would do. If, if someone, some debt was paid or someone was released from a crime, a post would be made. This person is no longer responsible. So this has been removed from us. We are no longer responsible for whatever this written code was. It was against us. We've been released from it, and because we've been released from it, the rulers and authorities, and it's clearly talking about the angelic forces in rebellion towards God, the spiritual forces that have come against God, uh, they're still working against God, their claim against us, their, whatever they use to manipulate us or motivate us or use us, they have been disarmed. They have nothing in Christ, they have nothing to come at us with. The only way that we can have a problem is if we get deceived and we go back over and start playing on their turf, following their rules, and they can begin to manipulate us. But there's really, it's vanity. There's no power there. It's because of our own ignorance. And that's where this says right here. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities. And that again is talking, we see that in Ephesians, we see that in Galatia, or, uh, uh, Colossians, well, right here. Uh, we see it in, in Paul's writings to the Corinthians. These powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So some key phrases here I want to look at. He, the, these powers and authorities, they've been disarmed. Whatever their weaponry was, they have been stripped of their armor. They have nothing. Uh, he made a public spectacle of them. There's some kind of a public display. Somewhere, maybe not on the earth where everyone can see it, although I think we can argue that case. When the apostles began to heal, when they began to go to the Gentiles and present the truth of the Gentiles, and their hearts were changed. This is a public demonstration that the powers of the rulers and authorities, they've been broken. The apostles are just healing. They're just speaking. The word of God is being effective. Uh, that, that would be a manifestation of it, but this is something else, and not, not something else, but it's more than that. A public spectacle of them. These authorities and rule powers were made a public spectacle, and then it says, triumphing over them by the cross. This all took place because of the cross. It wasn't something that, that, that God did, because God would have done it a long time ago. It's nothing that man accomplished, otherwise man could have accomplished this at different times during history. It was something that never took place until the cross. It happened on the cross, only the cross. And after the cross, these rulers and authorities, these powers and authorities have been disarmed. They've been made a public spectacle, a display. Everyone knows you have no power. You are stripped of your armor. And now there is a victory. And we'll talk about these words right here. If we have your notes from last week, page three of your notes. Um, if you don't have them, we've got a few left over there. And then I've got a, one page of front and back that, of course, I hope to get to today. Uh, but every uh, chapter, uh, page three, the first point, the first point I write is every word in verse 15 is challenging concerning which meaning should be translated. Um, and so, again, I'm teaching your thinking. I'll present different viewpoints if I think they're, they're viable or even some that I don't think are viable. Uh, but, of course, this needs continued study. I think we've got support, like I said, from Ephesians, throughout Colossians, other places in the Bible that I'm going to present this accurately. And remember, one of the things I like the most is teaching verse by verse because it's a safeguard. If what I've said the last few weeks doesn't connect into what I'm going to say today, and with where we go with this in the next verse, is chapter verse, uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 17, is going to begin with, therefore, meaning whatever I'm going to say is the basis of what now is true in verse 17. And if you don't see the connection, then whatever I presented needs to be back and, and refined, because where we're going with this, that because what I'm going to say right now, therefore, these things are now true. And if it doesn't make sense, then obviously I, I fail. So here we go. Uh, number two, point two. The rulers and authorities, and there's the Greek translation. You see in the Greek up on top, the interlinear and in the translation. This phrase seems to refer to the fallen spiritual forces that are in rebellion towards the Lord and hostile toward his plan. And again, when we say plan, 
We want to remember from the very beginning in the garden, God made man in his image and gave him dominion. And he's planning on doing something in this earth, in this world, in history with man. Mankind has a very special place and purpose. That has never been fulfilled. We can see bits and pieces of it, but the first thing that man does is crash. We don't know how soon it took, but he crashes and burns, eat from the tree of knowledge of of, of good and evil and begins to make his own choices and man never fulfilled that purpose God now through the man Jesus Christ the fullness of deity in bodily form is going to now redeem man so man can be put back in a place where he can accomplish God's purpose which again for me if we're talking eschatology makes complete sense that we've got to have the kingdom of God on earth not some far, far away place in a spiritual land called heaven. That somehow man has to be brought back to relevance here on the earth and God is going to fulfill his purpose for earth in time in a physical world. Again, that's you know debatable, but for me it, it makes complete sense. Um, uh, it says they include ranks of, and hierarchy of evil, thus the world rulers of this darkness. Um, Again, this is the rank. There's, there's several ranks. You're going to have certain, potentially with Satan at the top and then rulers and authorities, dominions and powers coming all the way down to the local level, almost like some, you know, the federal government coming all the way through down to the state government, to the city government. It, I mean, I, I, it's got to be the same. It's got to be similar to the hierarchy. They're not all just, and they are at, at, at odds with each other. And Jesus referred to this when he says, uh, when they say, well, you're driving out demons by Satan. And Jesus says, if Satan is divided against himself, his house cannot stand. And again, that is a true statement. These are not, this is not the kingdom of love and unity. You understand, when they may manifest in human nature or human history, there's wars and there's conflict and there's riots and there's, there's sin, uh, there's rebellion, there's deceit. And so when they manifest in human nature, they're manifesting their very nature. When God's kingdom manifests in human nature, it's going to be unity. It's going to be in Christ. There's going to be love. There's going to be production, righteousness, and growth. So, again, this is not a formidable kingdom in the sense that they're all unified. They're all unified against Christ. But then you can see, even in world history, they, they fight against each other. If it be nation against nation, and people versus people, and within families, tribes. Um, here it is, Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle, Paul says in Ephesians, not against flesh and blood but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And the heavenly realms are the spiritual realm around the earth, in the, in the air, manifesting in the world. Colossians 1.16, we've already read this verse in Colossians. For by him, Jesus Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, and for him, they were these rulers and authorities. This realm was created by Christ for Himself to use. Some of them have chosen to rebel against Him. Now we can also go back, and we still got angels and spiritual forces that are in line with Jesus Christ, and there's still rank and authority. You can see Michael and Gabriel are different types of angelic beings. There's the archangel. There's the warrior angel. There's the scribe angels. We can see all of this. There's some angels that are bound up at the Euphrates, for example, waiting for a point in history to do what they were assigned to do. They're just waiting for their moment. I mean, it's like, well, what, what God's got, he can create whatever he wants to do, and it's not like he's going to run out of angels. But nonetheless, we see the same thing in, this, in the God's kingdom. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. This is talking now about, uh, talking about, I'm rushing ahead here, um, uh, the, the triumphal procession that Paul is going to refer to in 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, where there is going to be this triumphal procession. We're going to get into the word here in a moment. Um, in, in the Roman world, they would go off and they would conquer a, a kingdom, they'd conquer a nation, they'd conquer a people. They'd be at war maybe for a few months, maybe for a few years. Uh, they'd come back to Rome. Uh, the general would bring his troops. It would take a while to get everything all set up. You know, they wouldn't just march back into the city. They'd make their grand entry because the people didn't have you know, television and, and on-the-spot reporters broadcasting back to Rome. They would have to just hear by report, written report, and a lot of times the people weren't sure what was going on, uh, especially in a timely way. So when they did win the battle, they'd come back and they'd try to show them what took place. Generally, it would be the spoils of war would be brought in. What did they take from these people? 
Then the general, and, and, and he would be brought in, and not, sometimes, you know, he could be very humble just walking in, but most of the time it would be, he'd have, have, he would have no armor on, he'd be in some kind of dress clothes, you know, formal wear, so that it was, he was no longer at battle, he was the victorious, he wouldn't come in with weapons, because it's like, that means you're still at war. He'd come in dressed like, a, not a civilian, but royalty in a sense, not yet as high as the emperor. Uh, and then finally the soldiers would come in celebrating. And they'd be singing songs of victory. Sometimes they'd even be singing songs of mockery of their leader because it's kind of a fun time. It's kind of like a party time. And so spoils, the general, and then the soldiers would come in. The spoils would include the captives. Some captives were valuable. Uh, they had skills. If they'd be craftsmen, if they have intellectual writing ability. Some of them could be all the way down to their worthless. I mean, there's, there's no, no, nothing here. They're just peasants. And uh, they could be taken off and you know, not, you know, sold into slavery, or if there were so many of them, they'd be taken and used as, as a gladiator bait to feed, you know, the lions, and they'd be watched, they'd be killed, or they'd have to be, fight gladiators, or they'd become gladiators. Uh, there'd be animals from different parts of the kingdom that people had never seen, treasures, you know, from the palace, uh, armor of the, of the generals that had been defeated, then models of the battle. And they'd actually have displays, some kind of a, almost like a homecoming float or a rose, or a rose uh, bowl parade, where they'd have some kind of a float that they'd create. So notice, this is not going to just be just a, in an instant. It's going to take a while. They'd build floats, and they'd actually be acting out what certain battles would look like so that people could see. And they didn't have television. They didn't have videotape. They didn't have these things that they had, a, that people would come and line the streets. And they just watch this parade go by, and there would be some kind of float showing battles. So you remember this, you've seen uh, movies or you've heard talked about, they, uh, like some of the Colosseums. They could flood the Colosseum and have reenact uh, naval battles in the Colosseum, and they'd act them out so that people could see, because they couldn't go to the war scene. They could watch, and they'd drain the water. They could act out during <coughs> military events in the Colosseum. They did the same thing here. Um, anyway, with that, I'll talk more about that. And I think that's important. For me, this is very important because it, it, it gives a picture, not only of this verse, but a picture of the, the spiritual kingdom that's trying to be, uh, the, this is a representation. Paul used this as a representation of what took place on the cross and at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what's taking place through history, through the church age. We had, the battle has been won. Christ is the conquering general, if you will. But we, in a sense, are the soldiers coming back in victory, or we're the ones bringing back the plunder or demonstrating, we're demonstrating the victory of Christ. We are not necessarily winning the victory, though victory's already been won. We're in the triumphal procession, and this triumphal procession is taking place between the resurrection of Christ and his second coming, if you want to consider that. And we are part, we're not trying to win the victory, we're demonstrating to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places the victory that has already been won. And that's one way of looking at it. Well, here, here's a couple of verses. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. But thank God, Paul writes, he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Do you understand that? Now that word, just triumphal procession, left alone, it's like, you're left to the imagine of triumphal procession, you know, and, and you got to fill in the blank. That was a technical word. That was a thing that people were familiar with historically, and they'd even some people had even seen it take place, and it was going to continue to take place for several centuries, a Roman triumphal procession. Uh, you could say uh, uh, the presidential inauguration. It's like, you know, Christ's presidential inauguration. If you say that to Americans, you get a picture of what that would look like. Or, you know, the Super Bowl championship uh, parade. It's like you get a picture of what that would look like. And so that's, that's why this is important. Not only in, in, in Scripture, but historically. What, what is Paul thinking when he says that? Uh, it says, uh, lead us in, along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere. So now we, you and I, are in this triumphal procession right now in the church age. And during this triumphal procession, he's using us in this triumphal procession to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere. Just like this triumphal procession of the spoils, the gentlemen, the soldiers, was to spread amongst the population of Rome 
what we just did. What was the victory? This is, how, this is who we conquered. And they would spread. Just by being in the procession, they demonstrate, spread the knowledge of the Roman victory. We are spreading the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. And this is your lifestyle. Now, this, this can include the things you say. It can include your ministry. You're going out and evangelizing. It can include, and it should include, your lifestyle, how you live, how you are as a family, how you are at work, how you interact with your friends, just how you view life, your, your attitude, how you put things in priorities. It's a perfume. It's a fragrance. Now, this is a great part of the verse. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Now, when you go among Christians and they see your hope, now you can verbalize it, you know, well, praise God, everything's going to work out. You can say that. Or you can just have an attitude and live a way that just your lifestyle of you just get up and you go back and do it again. You just continue using wisdom. You deal with people. You deal with situations with hope, with an anticipation of victory, or with a priority that you're going to do the best now. But... I'm not here for today. This doesn't have to be perfect. I'm looking forward to perfection. I'm looking forward to a fullness of my deliverance. My man, you know, we all want a good life, but we do understand that this is a fallen world. We have a fallen nature. We have bodies that are deteriorating. The whole universe is deteriorating. So our expectation is not perfection here. We understand there's going to be a fallacy here. There's going to be disappointment here. So when we face that disappointment, it's like, I can't believe that happened. It's like, well, where have you been? It's like, we're going to be disappointed. So when disappointment hits you, it doesn't derail you. It's kind of like, well, you know, that's part of life. And you continue. Now, you may say, well, praise God, it all works out. Or you just may get shocked and just keep moving forward. Now, the point for those who are being saved, you are a fra in this triumphal procession of Christ that we are living in today, you are the fragrance of life. To those who understand you, you're a source of encouragement. It's like, I can understand you, I can side with you, I want to be more like this, and it encourages them. It's a, it's a fr I smell the life in you. You weren't defeated. To others, your very attitude is the fragrance of death. It, it's like, because they're on the other side looking at it from a different perspective, your hope they don't have it, they begin to realize that they're locked in this temporal life. They have no hope. I mean, if you don't get it now, you're never going to get it because you have no anticipation for eternity. And they realize, my life is meaningless. My life is hopeless because I'm never going to solve this. I've got friends that can't solve it. We just keep going downhill, trying to figure out, trying to find pleasure in this. And to one, you are the fragrance of life. To other, the fragrance of death. Uh, just by the way you're living. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing, to one the fragrance from death to death, to the other the fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? In other words, you, you're in the triumph. The victory's already been won. You just need to live your life as a Christian, and you're, in a sense, fulfilling the victorious uh, procession because people see what you're doing. And you can, I mean, this is obvious in our, in our society today. People that are completely sold out into secular humanism, trying to find answers and, and frustration, and those who have a hope in Jesus Christ, an accurate hope in Jesus Christ, and how you view politics, how you view society, how you view your, view your values of life, your, your finances, your, your work ethic. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men, sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. Now, Paul is talking about this triumphal procession. Now, he's putting this in another position of here comes the spoils, followed by the general and the soldiers. Paul now, he says, because the Corinthians were having a hard time with their philosophy being Christianized, they'd actually paganized Christian philosophy, yeah, the, philosophy, the ideal of Christianity. And they are looking, in a sense, for their best life now. They are already spiritual. They're already there. And Paul was saying, wait a minute, I'm still suffering. I'm still paying the price. I'm still, and he, he labored this point with them because they were trying to experience the complete victory. And Paul says, well, well, look at us apostles. I mean, name an apostle 
who's living in complete victory. I mean, we're stoned, we're beaten, we're, we got pressure. I've got churches in revolt. I'm getting abused by the Jews. It's like, this is a struggle. I mean, name the apostles that have been martyred already, Paul could say. And yet, at you Corinthians, is like, life is great. You're already, he says, you're already living like kings. You're already living like you're in the kingdom age. He says, how I wish that were true. He says, because if it were true, we would be kings also. But the very fact that we're over here still in this procession, now in this case, he's putting himself in the place of being, well, like he says, uh, exhibit us apostles as last of all. And they'll remember the, the people that came in, the spoils, the captives came in. You'd have some dignitaries. You'd have some that could be sold in the slave market. Then you had those that were worthless that were then sent to the gladiators. And Paul says, we're like the last of the captives. It's like no one wants us. We're not worthy of any kind of a, a, a career. We're not worthy of being sold on the slave rock. We're just turned and sent right into the, the Colosseum for the gladiators. He says, that's what I feel. He said, that's, that's my experience in this triumphal procession. And he's mocking the Corinthians because they're, they're thinking they're the general. They're the ones, you know, celebrating, waving to the crowd. Ephesians 1.21 Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only this age, but also in the one to come. That goes back and picks up on the rule and authority. Ephesians 4, 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, we could go to Ephesians 4, 8, and we probably should. But that talking about Jesus' resurrection, when he came out of the grave, remember in Sheol, there were people that had died before Christ that were righteous, they died in faith, and they were in, again, this is a tough verse, Ephesians 4, 8, what is he talking about? Because he's going to say he led captive, captivity captive. And it's almost like he's talking about two things. When he came out of Hades, the place of the dead, Jesus Christ was resurrected, he led out of there everyone who had died in hope, waiting for the Messiah, he leads them out and takes them into heaven. Because when we die now, we go immediately to the presence of Christ. That's what Paul teaches. In the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, they always went to Sheol. Sometimes translated in your Bibles as the grave. Because it makes more sense, but it means Sheol. It means the underworld. It's Sheol in the Old Testament. It's Hades in the New Testament. They went down into the earth. Jonah kept drifting down. In fact, he went, made it all the way down to the bottom of the ocean, to the gates of Sheol. He had entered, in a sense, almost, almost in the land of the dead, and he was, in a sense, resurrected. I mean, if you read Jonah, he was, and if you read his poetry, he was entering the realm of the dead, and he was brought back to life. Uh, thus, Jesus used that as the sign of Jonah. But nonetheless, in the New Testament, you never see people going into Sheol or the underworld. You see them going immediately to the presence of Christ. So the captives that Jesus takes with him would be the captives in the underworld, the captivity he led captive. But also, these rulers and authorities are also have been taken captive. And so it's almost got a double meaning there. And that's in Ephesians 2. Now we go on to the word public, where you see a public display. Having disarmed the rulers and authorities... He made a show of them in public. See the word in public at the top there in the, in the Greek? It's parousia. It's a political term from the ancient democracy describing the freedom of public speech and address and the boldness that goes with it. The fallen powers have lost this, but the church has gained this in this age. In other words, it was a public, they had a chance, they made a public spectacle. Public means uh, to stand in, and be able to express yourself freely in public, and that was part of the democracy. You had the freedom to speak your mind. It was an ancient, ancient tradition. Uh, many of us are unfamiliar with this in, in our current culture. Uh, but the way the ancients used to do it, they could speak freely their opinions. Uh, they were not familiar with the woke culture or a cancel culture or hate speech. It was just called public speech. In this case right here, he made a public display, that's a word, it's public display, in public, in some kind of a speech, in some kind of a public display, he announced their condition. And it was, uh, again, defeat. Having disarmed, there's page 4.4 4 at the top, the word means to strip, to renounce, in the Septuagint, that's the LXX, means this, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, 
The Greek word was used, the same root word is used to refer to the stripping of enemies in war. In other words, when you defeated them in battle, you stripped their weapons. If they were dead bodies, you stripped the weapons. And this means he has disarmed them. It clearly means he stripped them of their weapons. They, they, they have nothing left. He made a show of them in public. This communicates that Jesus exhibited the hostile spiritual forces, the rulers and authorities, to the whole universe as having been taken captive by himself and left them public disgrace as powerless captives. Again, in, 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 the, in the temporal, physical world, we can see that in the lives of the apostles with miracles or just the fact that they could proclaim the message and entire cultures or entire cities would come to Christ just by hearing the message power in the word. They, they demonstrated that they did disarm. But in the spiritual realm, even more clearly, that you know they could actually see what was taking place, they were demonstrating to the universe, these people are now, or these beings, are now powerless. He made a public spectacle of them. And then here's the phrase, having triumphed over them, there's your word in the, in the Greek, triambiasis, means to triumph, used to say, I lead one as my prisoner in a triumphal procession. The word is translated, I lead one as my prisoner in a triumphal procession. So if Jesus was having this right here, having triumphed over them, that means he's taken someone as his prisoner and is leading them down the street as having been taken captive, which puts us right here. The that's what this was. The spoils would be taken down right through Rome. There's nothing. They've disarmed. There's no threat. I mean, you might have the most vicious warriors right there in the middle of the middle of Rome, walking down the street, children along the side, and families watching. And it's like there's nothing they can do. They're walking right through the middle. They've been completely stripped of their power, stripped of their weapons. They're being led down, publicly shown this is how great Rome is. And they would also have signs identifying who these are, and I'll show you that here in a moment. Um, um, the, the word in there, point B, points out there that the word they is there because it's referring to rulers and authorities, the multiple, uh, the Roman triumphal procession. There you get the, here we go, point C <laughs> of page four under six. The Roman triumph or the triumphal procession, there's your point, three basic points or parts, the spoils, the general, and the soldiers. Here's a little more detail, point two under C. Thy triumphal procession is a parade or a procession. And again, keep in mind, this was something that would take several days, if not weeks, to prepare to enter Rome. Just like the, the Rose Bowl parade, they don't just get together late Friday night and throw some things together and do it on Saturday. They take months getting ready for this big event. And so after this war, it would take a while to get And depending on where you're at in history or what kind of a war it was, or how much, how, how arrogant the general was. You can go back in the ancient days of Rome where they'd have a triumphal procession. You can imagine uh, the original homecoming parade might have been a pickup truck with the football team in the back and the cheerleaders going behind cheering and everybody stood the, and that would have been, there it was. It took, you know, two minutes for it to go down the street. Well, then that evolves into the Rose Bowl parade or how, you know, it, it, there's different levels of this concept. But nonetheless, you see point two there, I've got it written out there, captive spoils, animals, armor, models of battlefields, and the spoils could include anything having been taken by the conquered peoples, the statues they took, the gold, silver, weapons, slaves, coins, animals, royal captives, and even floats depicting action on the battlefield. Uh, this procession of booty was followed by the victorious military commander or the Roman general who had won the victory. The general himself was supposed to be the main attraction, that the general this is the spoils, this is the soldiers, it's all focused on this guy right here. So in our illustration, this guy would be Jesus. He's the one that it's all focused on. We would be the soldiers coming behind singing praises and the glory of what the, the, the emperor or the general had done. Or in Paul's case, he sees himself here, but we also see our, you know, proclaiming the victory spreading everywhere, the, the fragrance, but he also sees himself up here as because of the victory, he's now got a price to pay. And, we, you know, having says, you know, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction. He's got a job to do as an apostle that is more severe than anything else anybody, anybody else in church history would have to do. Throughout church history, we all have gifts, but it's possible the way Paul perceives it, the apostles had 
the most difficult, the most challenging, highest price to pay to achieve what God had called them to do. And so he puts himself there as the captives, as the least of the captives, because they're going to get the most abuse in this triumphal procession. So you see yourself here or here, depending on how, how, how it's being used as an illustration. Uh, uh, point B under two, the fame of captured kings and, and warriors, I spelled it wrong, and the abundance of the gold and plunder could tend to be more impressive than the general himself. So, I mean, when you start seeing all the, the enemy kings coming in, it may dwarf the little general coming along. So that's why they would not off, they would they would not necessarily walk. They'd want to be on some kind of a float. Sometimes it's very high, so it's like they'd have some kind of a splash when they presented themselves. The victorious general rode in a chariot in the shape of a tower with his children pulled by horses. Meaning, again, children are always an indication that there's peace. On, the, on the, his head was a wreath of, of laurel or a gold crown. He wore a purple tunic, a toga covered with patterns or designs, and he would hold a scepter. That would be just general reference to this, the general here. A general reference to the general. Okay. Point three, following the victorious military commander were his soldiers. They wore mil full military garb and their, their decorative you know, or, uh, you know, ribbons and different things they'd have. They would shout whatever that means, and no one's real sure what that means. I just put it in there. That's what they would shout, something like, you know, we have the victory or something. But it's something about triumph. A phrase of which the meaning was then and is now still not understood. They would also sing songs. Sometimes the songs would be of praise, but even they have records of them singing mocking songs, you know, about, you know, the, the bald old man, you know, who, you know, you know, walk your, well, kind of like an ACDC song, you know, Lock up your wives, lock up your daughters. Here comes the bald old general. You know, he's back in your home city. He'll be, you know, it's kind of like, you know, vulgar kind of like. But nonetheless, they're making fun of him. Uh, the procession went into the, and through the city of Rome, then culminated on the Temple of Jupiter. And the trump were here. Now, here's what I wanted to point out here, which is interesting. I hope you're still interested. If not, I apologize. This is what I find interesting. Because, again, this portrays right back into several places in the New Testament is now in 70 A.D., and you know this, in the year 66 A.D., the Jewish wars broke out. Paul's still alive. Uh, he goes into prison around 67 for the final time, uh, executed maybe in the spring of 68. So when Paul was still alive, or not alive, he was alive, but he's still moving through the, the Roman world ministry, uh, when the Jewish wars broke out. They continued for four years, which is amazing. The Jews held out for four years, against the Romans who came into Judea in 66 AD and took them until 70 AD to defeat them. Again, just a point in noting the passing. In 135, Hadrian had to face the Jewish wars again. So in a matter of 30, 65 years, the defeated Jews rebuilt, came back together, and led another revolt against the Roman Empire in 135, and that took three years, and one of the entire legions of Roman soldiers disappeared from the record books because they were defeated by the Jews. So the Jews took four years, 65 years later, they did a repeat. This is kind of, uh, both these times are the Jews thinking they had found their Messiah. And Jesus had mocked them because they rejected Jesus. He said, you'll follow someone else. And what they were afraid Jesus was gonna do was get them in trouble they did themselves after they executed Jesus. Nonetheless, 66 to 70 AD, the Jewish wars were fought. In 82 AD, now here we go, go like this, see if I can do this correctly. You've got Vespasian, and you've got Nero, is the emperor Vespasian, and then Titus, and then Dominion, Dom Domitian, and then Trajan. Now you, you know all of these guys, okay, at some level. Nero is the emperor who is there during Paul's time. He's going, to see, he's going to hear Paul talk. Paul will testify to Nero on at least two occasions, maybe three or four, depending on how many times he came back for, you know, hear the rest of the case. Nero's going to kill himself in 68 AD because he's gone crazy. His, his Praetorian guard is coming against him, and he's running and hiding in the city. He's public enemy number one. Vespasian is the general in the Jewish wars. When Nero kills himself, again, 68 AD, they're in the middle of the Jewish wars, Vespasian goes to Rome and claims the crown. Because he's got the military on his side, he claims the crown, and he is going to become the emperor at that time. Again, not, not that everybody agreed with it, but it was a power play, it worked out, uh, he did have some opposition. He puts his son in a place of uh, a general, 
and Titus then becomes the general for the final two years of the Jewish wars. Titus is the one who's given credit for burning down the temple. Uh, now, he, he didn't want it, according to the way Josephus records it, Titus, he wanted to preserve the temple because it was magnificent, just, just conquered. But someone let it, lit it on fire, and the whole thing went up in smoke. Remember, it's made out of stone, or block, brick, stone, you know, cut stone, but it would be paneled in wood. It wouldn't they just live in rock. It would be highly decorated with gold. Uh, I can tell you more about that, because the gold melted and got into the stones, and people spent years chipping away trying to get all the gold out of those stones that melted into while it was on fire. Okay, so Titus and, and Vespasian are the two, the, the, the emperor and the general, general, general who became the emperor, and Titus will follow his father as the emperor after his father dies, okay? Now, Domitian follows Titus as the emperor, and in 82, the war is ended in 70, but in 82, Domitian builds an arch to commemorate his father and his brother's victory over the Jews in 670 AD. This is, this is very important stuff. I mean, if you want to know history, you'd say, what's this got to do with anything? Well, it, it's, this is very enlightening if you understand this. Okay, so these are, the thing is, all these guys are historical, and they all are part of the Bible story. So Vespasian and Titus, they both become generals. Uh, they come back. They would have participated in the triumphal procession. So the general here was actually two people here. Vespasian the emperor and Titus would have been on the float coming down through the, the procession. Then after Titus dies, Domitian in 82 builds an arch. I'm going to show it to you. You've got notes of it. Depicting this moment when they came in. The, the triumphal procession that took place in 71 AD. And 11 years later, 10 years later, Domitian puts up a monument to commemorate this and puts images on it that the people of Rome remember having seen 10 or 11 years before. So we have the best that we can have of a photograph of the triumphal procession of the Jewish defeat by the Romans in 70 AD that Jesus prophesied of in 30 AD. I mean, we've got a photograph of it. I'll, you've got it right there in your notes. It's not a photograph, it's a carving. Now again, Domitian is going to put John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos in 96 AD. He's an old man, probably 90-some years old. Uh, he puts John on the Isle of Patmos, but Domitian is then in his office one day, signing papers, doing whatever emperors do, and Trajan comes in and executes him. And Domitian is killed, and Trajan now becomes the emperor and releases all of Domitian's political enemies which would include um, John. And uh, John then comes off the Isle of Patmos right around, and he lives until 98 AD. So that plays into the history of John. So Paul was with Nero. John was with these guys. Does that make sense a little bit about what's taking place here? Now, we have an account of this triumphal procession by Josephus. Josephus is a Jewish historian, and... Again, he's writing history, but he's writing it. You've you got to be careful with Josephus. He's not, it's not scripture, but he is an eyewitness. But he is writing, like any of us, when you're telling a story from a particular perspective. If a child comes home and tells his mom what happened at school when he got in trouble with the teacher because of what happened on the playground, he's going to explain to his mom his side of the story, and put himself in the best light possible. Have you ever done that? I even do that. I mean, if we have a conflict with the student in the class, I don't walk to the principal and say, I handled it completely wrong. I snapped at the student, raised my voice, and I, I just made the situation worse. It's, it's my fault. Absolutely not. I've been teaching it for too long. It's like... I beat the kid to the office, boom, paint the story, and then there. You tell them your side of the story, but I've already painted the canvas. Go ahead. I mean, it's, it's human nature. Am I evil? Well, of course I'm evil. I'm human. It's like, it's like you're going to protect yourself. Okay. Um, my boys did that. I had a parent one time tell me, met way back in the 80s, she says, my son never lies. <laughs> it's like, okay, okay. I, 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 was a young, I was a young father and a young teacher. I was in my 20s. It's kind of like, 
It, it, that's, not, that's not possible. I mean, and when a parent says, my son would never say that. It's like, your son would say a lot of stuff. It's like, where he, I will say a lot of stuff. Okay, Josephus. I don't want to discredit Josephus. But Josephus' story, he is a general of the, of the Jews. Josephus is a Roman general fighting against the Romans coming in. Josephus is a Pharisee. He's trained like the Apostle Paul. He's of the line of the Pharisees. So he's scriptural. He's conservative in his biblical values or in his biblical interpretation. And he's a military general fighting the Romans. He's defeated early. Uh, up in Galilee, when the Romans came in, he was defeated early, and he decides, it's like, there's no way. First of all, he, he himself is convinced that the Jews aren't going to win. We, we, we can't beat Rome. So he knows that. He's defeated. They've lost the battle. He also writes in his writings prophetically, meaning he, he feels that the Lord has showed him some things that this is not going to end well. So he goes to the, the, the general's tent. He surrenders, goes to the general's tent, as in put in front of Vespasian, the general, leading the campaign, and says, you're going to win. We're not going to win. I surrender. How can I help you convince my people to surrender so you do not destroy our land? He says, and the Lord has showed me you are the next emperor. Now this was before, remember, the wars broke out in 66, Nero kills himself in 68, so it's during this time period this takes place. And within a few weeks, word comes to Vespasian, while him and Josephus are still negotiating, that, that Nero's dead, and the military wants Vespasian in Rome to become, replace Nero. Well, Josephus now has wisely surrendered, come over and says, not... You know, you dirty dog Romans, you know, I wish you'd all die. He says, how can we help you so you don't destroy our land? How can we cooperate? And they've been cooperating since the days of Herod. You know, you go back to Herod, you go back to 4 B.C., 18 B.C., Rome has been working with the Jews. And so the Pharisee, he, uh, you know, it's not unusual. And then he prophesies and Vespasian, and now he, he gets promoted. Now Titus, his son, comes in, and now Titus... And Josephus worked together. In fact, Josephus goes to Jerusalem. He continues with the military, trying to convince the soldiers just to, just to back off. Now, who's this sound like? If you know the Old Testament, you know who this sounds like? Name somebody. I, I don't want to put you on the spot. This is exactly what Jeremiah did. Jeremiah went to the king after king and says, God has given this kingdom, the whole land, to Nebuchadnezzar. The only way you're going to survive is to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. If you resist him, he's going to burn this place to the ground. God has told me. And Jeremiah was written off as a traitor, as non-patriotic, the enemy of the people. But he lives through the whole thing and is told by Nebuchadnezzar, where do you want to go? Do you want to come back with me to Babylon? You can stay here in the land. Wherever you want to go, the whole land is yours, Jeremiah. And again, that's the story of Jeremiah. So Josephus is running along the same lines as Jeremiah. And anyway, he, they recognized him as a prophet because his prophecy came true, at least he does. Now, what happens with Josephus is after the war is won, he goes back and is adopted into the family of uh, Vespasian and is, in a sense, Titus' adopted brother and is set up in his own place and he writes the Jewish wars. He writes the Jewish history. That's why you've got a volume of a book called Joseph, the Writings of Josephus. He writes from the beginning throughout the whole Old Testament. He explains the whole Old Testament from the views of the Pharisees, or at least from his view as a Pharisee, of what happened in the Bible. Gives you stories and details that are not in the Bible. Now, again, is he, is he a Christian? I, I don't think so. Is he a, a, a good Jewish man? I definitely think so. Is he an honest man? Yes, but he's telling the story from his angle. Is everything he writes historically accurate from the Old Testament? We have no way of telling many things. But it does record stories, inside stories about Moses, stories about Joseph and what was going on in Egypt, different things. Everything's got a little bit of color added to an insight that you've got to be very careful with because it's not biblical, but it was what the Pharisees believed at that time 
coming out of the writings of Josephus, which would be very similar to Paul at that time. But then he then explains the Jewish culture, the Jewish customs, describes the temple. In fact, when we talk about where the temple is located, you read Josephus, that it's, it's, it's where, where, you know, where we talk about where Ford Antony is connected to it. He gives all the measurements. It fits exactly what's going on there. Because he, he saw Herod's temple. He, he ministered, not ministered, but he worked around and, and, and studied along the, on the, on the colonnades. So Josephus sees these things. But remember, he's writing about the Jewish wars in Rome as a special guest adopted into the royal family of the emperor. So what happens in his writings, it's, it's very clear. The Romans always did the best they could of not overpressing the Jews. They, they always like, we really wish the Jews would do that, but now we've got to. So the Romans are always the patient ones. They're the ones that are always negotiating. They're the ones that we wish we didn't have to do this, but we're going to have to burn your entire city down. I mean, because he's writing, again, from Rome, and you can't, you can't write, you know, Titus was a jerk, and his father Vespasian was a wicked man, and he's like, wait, this is, you're living at their dollar, you're, you're on the payroll. So again, you've got to take into consideration some of those things. Again, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's nice to have it, but uh, again, I have no, it just, it is what it is. Um, Josephus, uh, interesting, I so many things, I mean, okay, we got a book like this of Josephus, and I've got to stop talking because we can spend, you know, it's like, as big as the Bible, so we can spend you know, 30 years talking about Josephus. Nonetheless, what we have right here is the triumphal procession coming back. In, he was there and observed the triumphal procession. During the hours of darkness, the whole military force had been led out in companies and battalions by their officers and had been drawn up, not as usual, near the gates of the palace of the Palatine, but near the temple of Isis. For Titus and Vespasian spent the night there, and now as dawn began to break, they emerged crowned in laurel wreaths, wearing the time-honored purple clothes, and walked to the Octavian colonnade. There the Senate, the magistrates, and those of the uh, equestrian status were waiting for their arrival. Then he goes through and talks about it. He describes the triumphal procession. I'm not going to read it all to you. Of course, I would like to. That third paragraph on that page, it is impossible to do justice in the description of the number of things to be seen and to the magnificence of everything that met the eye, whether in skilled craftsmanship, staggering richness, or natural rarity. They're talking now about the spoils. He says, I cannot tell you everything that, that they brought in. It was magnificent. And again, it's going to leave an impact on the people. For almost all the remarkable and valuable objects which have ever been collected piece by piece by prosperous peoples were on, on that day massed together, affording a, a clear ghost through talks of quality of silver, purple. I'm turning the page. Page 6. Uh, oh, the, the top paragraph on page 6. The greatest amazement was caused by the floats. Their size gave grounds for alarm about their stability. I mean, they were so high that people were like, if this tip's over, we're all going to die. Uh, some three or four stories high, and in the richness of their manufacture, they provided an astonishing and pleasurable sight. It goes on and talks about that. Uh, next paragraph, spoil and abundance was carried past. None of it compared, watch this, here's what you want, with that taken from <coughs> the temple in Jerusalem. Now here's an eyewitness account. Where do the temple treasures go? Josephus says, right here in the triumphal procession, going into Rome. A golden table, many stones in weight, and a golden lampstand, similarly made, which was quite unlike any object in daily use. A center shaft arose from its base, and now he's describing the, 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 the candle stand from the temple or at least one of them. There may have been several. Sometimes they had some in storage. So we don't know if it was the actual one or one that was in storage. So they had more than just one that they would use. Uh, there were seven of these lamps, thus emphasizing the honor paid by the Jews to the number seven. A tablet of the Jewish law was carried last of all the spoil. Now that would be nice to have. After it came a large group carrying statues of victory, all of them made of ivory and gold. The procession was completed by Vespasian and behind him Titus. The mission rode on horseback wearing a beautiful uniform and on a mount that was wonderfully well seen. And it goes on and talks about where it ends up. It goes through and talks about this. Now, as we leave that reading right there, 
they also had the, uh, the, the, the garment, not the garments, but the curtains, parts of the curtains of the temple were brought in and put in the Palace of Victory. They were on display for many centuries there in Rome on display in the, in the Victory Palace. And you can see the, the temple curtains and the temple treasures that's recorded by someone else. If you read on, uh, if you got the Jerusalem book and go to the Nea Church and read that section, or if you go on my website and find the Nea Church, uh, you can see that. Uh, but what ends up happening is these temple treasures end up in Rome. Now this is just a side note. Where did the temple treasures go? Well, they could have gotten melted down. They, could, they were in Rome. They were clearly in Rome. When the vandals came in, they captured many things, and were, they were taken by the vandals, the barbarians. Then the Byzantines conquered the vandals and recaptured the temple treasures, and they brought them to Constantinople, or Byzantium. Um, and, and a Jew was there seeing the procession, the Trump procession coming in. This is recorded in history. I've got it in my book. A Jew was there standing by or near uh, the, the emperor, uh, Justinian, and told him, he says, you do not want these here. These belong in Jerusalem. He says, look what happened to Rome when they put them in Rome. Look what happened to the Vandals when they took them there. You put them here, we're going to die for sure. These, these AD must have saw Indiana Jones in the first episode. But anyway, he says, get them back to Jerusalem. What we find in Jerusalem is the Nea Church. N-E-A means the new church. Huge, massive stones. You can still see some of them in the south wall sticking out. There's still some. And you can see the, 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 the sanctuary up the front of the church. It's, we, had to find it. we had to find it ourselves. <clears throat> in fact, we got in trouble. We are looking around for it. We, we guys said, well, I'll show it to you. And he showed it, took us back and down this alley and, and showed us where it was. And then he goes, you got some money. And I said, I, I don't have, so I gave him some change. And then he says some word I can't say in church. I mean, it's not even in the Bible type of word. Uh, uh, called us these types of Americans and, and slapped me and walked off. But he thought he was going to pay him for showing But anyway, so we got some pictures out. But I, cultural difference. And I thought he was just being friendly. Hey, I'll show you where it's at. It's like, then he had to pay. It's like, well, I just had some change. It made, giving a guy like 20 cents for, you know. <laughs> A taxi ride or something. Anyway, he's just walking around the corner. Nonetheless, I, we didn't get a chance to go underneath there, but underneath there is, is these huge <laughs> pillars, and there's a, inside is, is a, a scribe, a, a inscription from Justinian from the day that they opened that, 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 that church up, and that is where they said they brought all the temple treasures back into that place, and it was almost built like they say the temple. And so anyway, that's where it is. And then, then the Persians come in and attack and give it back to the Jews. So maybe the Jews got them back and they're hidden somewhere. No one knows where they're at. No one knows where the Ark of the Covenant's at. Nonetheless, that's just interesting. Now, the Arch of Titus is on page 7. This You can see this today. This is amazing stuff, I think. This is page 7, and there's a picture of it. And this was built in 82... Um, about by uh, commemorating Titus's victory, you can see it right there, and there's stuff written up there, and you can read all this right there. Turn the page, and you can see what's written on the top there. I've got it translated. It means the Senate and the people of Rome dedicated this to the divine Titus, son of divine Vespasian, Vespasianus Augustus. And that's the full name of Titus Vespasian Augustus. And then inside, if you walk into the arch, and you look up. On one of the panels, that's what the panel is right there. You see that panel right there? It's images from the triumphal procession that day in 82 AD. Images of the inside the arch of Titus showing the Roman triumphal procession in Rome with the temple treasures. Turn the page, and there's another picture right there. There's a close-up of that, and you can see very clearly the candle stand. You see the candle stand. Now, it's interesting. What did the Jewish candle stand look like? Ten years after it went down the street of Rome during the Trump procession, this is how the artist drew it. Or not drew it, but carved it in stone. So there, that's, that's not what I would think it looked like, but that's what they did. Then up in front of that, you can see that an X kind of like, those are silver trumpets that are being carried. And right behind it is the table of showbread. That is the table where they put the, the bread on inside the temple. Then you see those things that look like television cameras or, you know, like video cameras. You see that? Those are signs. Those are signs. Because no one knew what any of this stuff was. So as they went down the Trump procession, if this was the king, they would have a sign being held up and his name would be on it. And if this was, you know, this is the gold taken from the banks. This is the, these are the, the king's daughters and sons. And then they'd have this right here and they'd identify those objects 
right there with those signs so they could see what they were. Um, oh my gosh, I got to quit. Uh, here, to turn the page, there's a close-up of the candle stand, and there's a close-up of this right there, and there's many things set right there. There's the details. I cut and pasted this off of the back page. I cut and pasted it out of my book, talking about the Nia Church. Give some information. If you want to do this very quickly, if you got your phones, if you got your phones, take your phones out. You know, this, they're, they're legal here. You can have any class. And just go to generationword.com. Very simply, just generationword.com. I did this for you just this morning. And then backslash, just type one dot jpeg. Just generationword.com, backslash one, then dot jpeg. And this is the picture I put up there. It's a picture, it's this picture right here. This one right here, like this. You like this one. But it's colorized. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when we look, when you think about Greek statues, this is the truth. This is the truth. I found this out. I found this out several years ago, uh, about five, six years ago. They were doing research on these. And all, the, all these statues, all these gray statues, you know, they're very bland in society, just very bland. They just had, you know, they're all marble statues. They weren't, that's not what they were. They were painted. And they went to the Arch of Titus and they dug in the very detailed, you know, microscopic, you know, examinations. And they found out what color the pigment was that was coloring. And like the golden candle stand was, was a golden yellow. And so then they would paint, on not, not, they didn't paint the art, but all those things, all those statues, like you got a, a statue of, you know, uh, Zeus. Or it's the name a statue of, uh, I'm trying to think of some god or something. Or an emperor. They would have, you know, they'd have like those, just those marbled eyes, just marbled eyes. And they're just like blank. Because they would paint eyeballs on those. And so they're very colorful. So you walk down the street of, of ancient Greece or Rome, you don't just have all these bland marble statues like what we would think of. They were just highly decorated because they find pigment inside the stone or the marble. So you can see right there, just generationword.com. But it's amazing of the detail of, of what, what, what was put on that. Anyway, that's the Arch of Titus, and there's a photograph of all we just talked about the triumphal recession that they've been taking, the captives have been taken captive, or the rulers and authorities have been taken captive, and they're being led in this triumphal recession. They're defeated. And this is what Paul was thinking of. This is what Paul would have been thinking of. Some of that is, and we also see the example of the uh, 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 pictures of the triumphal procession of the, of the destruction of Jerusalem and Josephus' account of it. Um, and so we'll have to pick this up. I didn't get to where I wanted to today. But I don't know. I, I think that's interesting. I hope you like that. Um, there's, I'll quit. I'll pray and just, again, crash land the message. I always admire people that have like this smooth ending and, and you know, that's what, that, you get the, that's where it's like, but everyone bow your head and then you do a little altar call and, and it's like that or whatever. And then it's just, oh, so you have music start playing and I just kind of, boom, put you up, boom, crash and we'll start again. It's like, we don't even need a runway, just crash the plane every week. Okay. Anyway, I appreciate your, your patience in putting up with that kind of flying. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the chance to look into these things. We do ask that we'd find strength and encouragement from history, but from your word, from your spirit, and from being with other believers. We do thank you for the opportunity to live this time in history, and ask that we can live in a way that would indeed spread a fragrance of life among those who are believers and a chance to receive Jesus Christ among those who are doubting or, or in denial. Father, we do thank you again for the chance to live this time in history and pray for revival in our churches and our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your time.